Uh, please read the announcements concerning the end of the semester. Um, they were posted. Uh, your final will be available Saturday through Friday, and you have two hours to take it. Um, I posted a review. Um, I guess the review is meaningful, but um, you know the review pretty much says everything we covered. You know, <laughs> so you know, I mean, it's it's not really. Uh, you know, I guess it helps, but you know, maybe maybe it's a reminder of the important things. One thing I will say is I will look at it. I, I have it ready, but I will look at it again after today's class to adjust it in case there's something that we haven't really talked about a lot, just on the odd chance. Um, and uh, no classes or anything next week. If, but I am available. You know, I don't. Is I, there's nothing scheduled. If you need to see me about something, make you know, call, me, you know, contact me, and, and we'll arrange something. All right, I'm going to talk about deployment now, and I want to make sure we understand where we're coming from. Deployment, simply put, is how you're going to get your application in the hands of your users. All right. Now, the one thing that might be misleading, I was thinking about this as I was in my head preparing to talk about this is this isn't something that you finish a project and say, OK, how are we going to get it out into the hands of our users? This is something that's designed and planned from the start. So it, it, you know, it affects how you're going to develop it, which path you're going to take. All right. Simply put, there are two extremes. And there's possibilities on either extreme. And then there's a giant gray area in between when it comes to deployment matters. All right. The two extremes are like this. Everything, uh, scratch that, we'll try again. All on the user machine is one option. The other option is all on a server. All right. And then there are a bunch of things that are gray areas. Maybe most of it's on the client, but it uses a shared data that's out on a, on a database server somewhere. Or maybe Stuff lives on the server, but it gets downloaded to the client. So it sort of ends up on the client um, eventually. All right. So those are kind of your options. You know. Let's talk about all on the user side. This would be typically where you install a standalone application On, on your machine. And by standalone, I mean it doesn't need to be connected to the web or anything. All right? Now, this could be two different things. This could be a computer application, or it could be a mobile application. That would sort of be the standalone extreme, extremely standalone, extremely on the user machine and on the user, user machine only. That's where you install a application, it lives on the user's machine, and they run it. All right? The other end of the picture, and that, that could either could be a computer application or a mobile application. Uh, Java is the language of Android. So again, just to sort of precurse my comments again, um, we're talking about deployment here, and deployment is a decision that's made before development. In other words, you're, gonna, you're not going to develop your application and then decide how you're going to uh, deploy it. Deploy it. How you're going to deploy it is a key factor in how you're going to develop your application. 
And we have two extremes. We have where everything lives on the user machine. That would be a complete standalone application. Whereas you would have an install program and you installed it and everything would be there. On the other end, you have everything on a server or to use the terminology that people love to use these days, a cloud-based solution where user doesn't need anything but a browser, a web browser to access it. All right. What we're going to touch on is we're going to touch on what the Java version of these things are. Because these are your options regardless of what kind of application you're talking about. Right? Whether you're talking about a Windows application, a Mac application, a um, iOS application, uh, a web application. Regardless of the language, these are your options. All right? We're going to focus on the Java flavor of these options. So the complete standalone would be to have a standalone application that you would download and install. The complete cloud-based application would be a browser-based application. That is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the client with Java running on the server to process the HTML and to create the HTML. Server-side coding. We're going to start by talking about the two extremes. If we have time, I'll actually go through the process of making a jar, which is, which is part of um, the standalone process. We'll talk about the two extremes, and then we'll talk about how a lot of applications somehow fit somewhere in the middle of this. All right, Somewhere in the middle between everything being on the client machine, everything being in the cloud. All right, typically, simply put, for this, installing a standalone application, there would be some sort of install procedure. And there are programs that allow you to make install procedures. There's actually software and an IDE. You notice in this class we typically don't use an IDE, but there are IDEs for Java that include build tools as well. All right, if you were to use Eclipse, for example, there's tools for building a jar and stuff like that in there, whereas we focus on um, the coding uh, on a nuts and bolts uh, by hand uh, level. All right, so you'd create an install procedure. What would you be installing? In the case of a Java application, you would be creating typically a jar. And what does JAR stand for? JAR, JAR stands for Java Archive. And the install procedure would put the Java Archive in a certain location, would initialize any control files that are needed, and so on. All right. In the case of Android, you also create a file. And it escapes me the extension on that file. I'll have to look it up. Does anyone know off the top of their head? What do you get when you install an Android app? APK, thank you. You create an APK. All right? And an APK, I believe, stands for Android Package. All right? And that's what, so like if you download, uh, if you have an Android phone and you download an application, you're downloading an APK. And that contains the information that it will, um, it will um, allow it to install on your machine. Now again, we're thinking in extremes here. We're thinking, first of all, the extremes of the standalone application. What are the advantages of a standalone application that's installed on your machine or your device? Pardon me? All right. You, it, it, can, it, can work and it can work regardless. You don't have to be be connected for the application to work. All right? Um, some silly games that I download from the, the Play Store, it amazes me. Like, I'll have a problem with my internet connection or something, and... Um, like, I can't play them. 
because it's trying to connect to the internet for something. It's so frustrating. I just want to play goofy tic-tac-toe or something, right? And I'm not doing something you know, crazy where I have to share data with thousands of people you know, or whatever. It's just some silly little game and yet it's written to be connected, uh, to require a, an internet connection. That, that bugs me. Well, with the standalone application, if it's truly completely standalone, you wouldn't need to be connected to the internet. Another advantage or disadvantage of it. Yeah, it's, a lot, it's likely to be faster. In other words, everything is there. So as you're doing things, it does not have to travel through the internet. Ask a server to do something and then send back a response. So it's typically going to run faster. All right, you're not going to have any issues related to the server being busy, your internet connection being slow on that particular day, or whatever. Everything is run right there on the machine. Yes? True. If it's truly a standalone application, you're not worried about multiple users. All right, so you don't have any issues that come down to those, which could be performance or conflicts, possibly. Um, that's true. Other advantages or disadvantages? Yeah. Yeah, updating the application. All right. In other words, if you're not required to be on the internet and you can run it on there, what happens if there's a major bug fix? You know, you only get that if you go and install the update. Now, Android has some capability in the Android system to automatically update stuff and and operating systems have that. But again, you still have to have the settings correct and you still have to, to update it. We had a big issue uh, at a company I worked uh, with um, where we had a, a application for our field service engineers. And they were, the field service engineers are the people that went out in the field to fix this company's machines, the machines that this company sold. And um, the problem was is like they didn't work out of an office, right? They worked with their laptop and they were like on the road. You know, they, they weren't at, stationed at, at one office for very long. They were on the road fixing, you know, so maybe the field service engineer for Ohio would be in Toledo one day and, and Akron the next day or two days later or whatever, you know, traveling around fixing stuff. Well, in an environment like that, they may not be in the office in the old days anyhow to get a CD. Or they may not dial up to the company to see if there's any updates to their application. So as a result, we, it was frustrating for us back at the corporate office because we would fix bugs, and yet those bugs were still occurring. Why? Because it was impossible for us to roll out our application to 1,000 users all at the same time. right? And so a disadvantage of that is because you don't have to be connected, because you can run sort of untethered and not connected, you may not get the latest update of something. And therefore, bugs that were fixed might still be there. All right? Other issues. I think that's a reasonably good summary, I, except to say one thing. The fact that a standalone means that you can't really share. Again, remember, right now we're talking about the extreme cases of it's totally standalone on your machine. There's a, a myriad of possibilities between totally cloud-based and totally standalone. All right? We're just talking from sort of a theoretical perspective, is that you can't share stuff. If it's on your machine, it's on your machine. Which means if you go home and want to work on something, you're out of luck. Right? Unless you figured out a way somehow to transfer it or whatever. All right? But you're out of luck. Or if you and your friend are working on something, um, you're out of luck that way. It's just like the difference between using Google Docs, for example, which is a cloud-based solution, and using old school Microsoft Office, where you had the software, you had your documents on your machine, made it difficult to share, collaborate, and so on. So I think that's a good coverage of the, of the theoretical advantages and disadvantages um, of standalone. You can almost flip those around when you talk about the cloud. You know, a cloud-based. A cloud-based will, will, will allow you to create applications using what's called server-side code. 
Now, I apologize if this is repetitive for some of you, because some of you have had me in some of these other classes. Some of you may not have been. But let me rever uh, uh, review what I mean by server-side code. And if you haven't had any of these classes, this will be a little introduction for you. Um, most web pages, in the old days, web pages were simply stored on a server. The client would ask for them, and the server would deliver them. <coughs> These are called static web pages. Static used this way means that they don't change. All right, so if you requested a page today, it would look the same as it did a day ago, or six months ago, or the last time someone manually went in and changed it. If you think of a very simple site, like maybe a site for a restaurant, a restaurant could possibly have a static website, right? Because restaurants, you know, they don't change their menus all that often, right? At least many of them don't. You know, they, the, the locations, you know, they don't build a new restaurant every other week or whatever, you know. So there might be a page that talks about the location, shows some reviews, shows a list of the breakfast, lunch, and dinner menu. And it really is going to be the same for everyone. There's not really any customizing of the site depending on who accesses it. It just is what it is. Very basic. It's almost like an electronic brochure. All right? In fact, in the old days, people called sites like that brochureware. Right? You could print out a carryout menu, or you could have it on a website, and people could view it. But if you think of something more involved like Canvas, all right, or like any of the big web applications that people use on a daily basis these days, like Facebook, eBay, Google, um, any of them. They're dynamic. What does that mean? That means that you don't have people out there pounding out HTML pages for every single user. All right, that'd be ridiculous. There isn't an army of programmers in one of those buildings that creates a different web page for every student that logs into Canvas. Right? There is instead a script. And what is a script? Script is a program. Not really any difference between a script and a program. Just a different context for it. And can this program be written in Java? It absolutely can be written in Java. So this is where the Java tie-in comes in. It doesn't have to be written in Java. It can be written in C Sharp or, or PHP or Python or any number of different application languages. But it could be written in Java. And its job is to take information that the user supplies and interact with the database and produce effectively custom HTML on the fly for every unique circumstance. Now that sounds like a lot and it sounds extreme, but it's true. That's, that's what it does. If you go and do a Google search, if everyone was sitting at a computer and we all typed in a Google search at the same time, we're all getting back a custom HTML page based on we, what we typed in. So if I Googled Java and someone else uh, Googled uh, JavaScript and someone Googled PHP and all that, we'd get our own custom response. The same page, the same Google search page, would give us each our own results based on what we keyed in. Or like in Canvas, we all logged in to Canvas at the same time. All of our pages would look different because we're all enrolled in different classes. And what's more, I serve a different role. I'm not a student um, faculty. So the page would be created just for me. All right, well, you can't do that with plain old HTML. That's where it takes a real programming language to do it. And that programming language could be Java. All right? Now, there's two ways, two main ways of creating dynamic web pages using Java. There are what are called Java servlets and JSP pages. JSP stands for Java Server Page. In reality, these end up working out just about the same. All right? 
you can think of Java servlets as being a Java class that outputs HTML. So we've written classes that have outputted text. Well, a certain kind of class in Java that outputs HTML is a Java servlet. And if someone requests a Java servlet, they will get back some HTML, because that's what Java servlets out, output. A JSP page is sort of the opposite. It's a HTML page that contains Java. So this is kind of like the old uh, Reese's peanut butter cup commercial, right? You got chocolate in my peanut butter. You got peanut butter in my chocolate, right? It's just a matter of perspective. They both essentially do the same thing. Both of them are a mix of HTML and Java code. It's just that in one case, you have Java code that contains pieces of HTML. And in the other case, you have HTML that contains pieces of uh, Java. Let's quickly Google these things. Have, have all of you done at least a little bit of HTML? Has anyone not done any HTML? Good. All right. Here's an example of of what? What happened? Oh, here we go. Here's an example of a Java servlet. It's a class, just like we've created classes. It extends HTTP servlet. So it is, um, it is a child class of servlet. It has an init, uh, init method. All right. It has a do get method, which effectively is when you request the servlet, this is the code that writes the HTML. And what are we doing? Well, we are writing our response to contain just a little snippet of HTML, h1 message and h1 tag. Right? This is a real simple example. But we could make it more extensive. We could have a whole bunch of these out statements. And we could do calculations first. And we could access a database to pull information out. And we could do all sorts of things. All of these would go as part of the do get method. All right? Yes? Yeah, you could do anything that any programming language could do. So you could manipulate CSS. More than likely what you would do is is you would, you would still use CSS. You would create an HTML file that linked to a CSS file. But you could do some, some fancy things. You, know? you could make it, depending on the time of day, um, use a darker color for the background if you wanted to. Depending on the season of the year, use different color schemes or whatever. You have a full-blown programming language at your disposal, so you, could really, you have the flexibility to really do anything that you, you want. All right. And again, when you requested this, what would you get? You would get that HTML page that would simply add an H1 with hello world. So that is a Java servlet. It's Java code that contains some HTML that gets written to the client. A JSP page Here's an example. It is an HTML page that has snippets of Java inside of it. So the stuff that's not included in these little thingies are just plain old HTML. The stuff that is included in these little declarations, the greater than percentage sign, the web server will interpret as Java and it will execute it as Java. 
So we could mix Java and HTML. So again, it's both of those, both serverless and JSP are a mix of Java and HTML. It's just a matter of like, is it Java that contains HTML or is it HTML that contains Java? All right. Yes. Is JSP Java exclusive or do you Yeah, the last thing that you said. JSP is distinctly Java. Now, there are other languages you could write server-side scripts in. You could write server-side scripts in PHP, for example. And the concept would be very similar. The difference would be is you would not have Java within these little thingies. You would have PHP code, and you'd use that language. Or in the ASP.NET framework, you could do it, and you could use C Sharp or VB. All right. So yeah, there's a bunch of different languages you can write server-side code in. And the basic idea would all look like these JSP pages, but JSP itself is specific to Java. Yes? Absolutely. So the, the question was, is would you have like a Java class that, that you would call from your web page? Absolutely. So for example, let's say like our tuition calculation, which we did this term. Let's say we were making LC's website. Let's say that was how we were going to deploy our application. It's going to be part of the website. We would have a JSP page that would create our tuition class, supply the residency, whether they were in, on, you know, uh, in county, out of county, whether they're a graduate student or what, it would get the result from that function that said that the tuition is $1,200 and then it would display it on the page. So absolutely, this, this simple example doesn't do it, but you, you, could, you would write your own custom classes like for your business logic and call that from there. Absolutely. So these are two sort of alternatives for having a pure cloud-based application. Now, what are the respective advantages and disadvantages of this, whether we're talking about cloud-based, which would either be servlets or uh, JSP? Well, we can just flip the advantages and disadvantages. You do have to be connected to the web. There could be lag based on the server being very busy or your internet connection being very slow. You know, sometimes, you know, at, at busy times in the semester, for example, logging into Canvas is a chore. You sit there and just stare at the screen for a long time. All right. Your internet that provider could be down. Exactly. However, Sharing is possible. Again, this would be like Google Docs, right? You could create a document that lived out in the cloud. If you updated a database, you'd be updating a database that lived in the cloud. Therefore, other people could access that information. All right? And lastly, of course, what's the deployment issue? There isn't a deployment issue, right? Because in the case of a standalone application, I would have to update every single machine that had that application. In the case of a cloud-based application, I only have to update the server. The only requirements on the client side is that it runs on a browser. Now, that sort of points out another advantage of cloud-based and uh, a disadvantage of the standalone. There are certain minimum requirements to do a standalone application. Namely, you have to have the JRE installed on your machine. And if your machine is weak, then the application might take a hit, run slow. With web-based applications, you can have what's called a thin client. What do I mean by thin? I mean not particularly powerful. All right? Not particularly powerful. Or, for example, I could run 
and, and there's no requirements really on, on the client end. So I could, I could access Canvas from a Windows machine, from a Mac machine, from a phone, thank you, uh, from a Linux machine, from anywhere. All I have to do is I have to have a web browser. So the requirements are minimal for cloud-based applications where the requirements are typically more extensive, especially if you get into having databases and other fun stuff in your application. You know, you might have to have a machine that's capable of supporting uh, a small database if you're, if you're doing uh, a standalone application. All right, now I said there's a whole lot of gray areas. And what do those gray areas involve? Well, some of the enhancements to HTML allow you for example, if you're not connected to the web, to show a cached version of a web page. Cached is like the, the version of the web page the last time that you loaded it. So for example, during the World Series, all right, I'm a cheapskate and I don't have cable. All right? So I was following the games via ESPN. All right? So I would periodically refresh the page and see what the score was or whatever. All right? Let's say my internet went down in the middle of the game. Depending on how it was written, it could be that the application would simply show me the last page that I had seen over and over again, which is better than nothing, right? I could see at least, be reminded what the score was, see the box score, whatever. It wouldn't be current, up to date, but at least it wouldn't give me an error. So web applications, cloud-based applications, can be smart enough to cache themselves. And if it's not been, if you're not connected to the web, you will see in your browser the last legitimate version um, that you were able to download. You would have to visit a page that you've already visited. Repeat that, please. Well, it could be the current page. Yeah. We talk, about, we, we talk about this in more detail in the mobile web developing class, but you can, you can specify which pages. You, can speci you as the web developer can specify which pages you want to be cached, all right, and which pages you don't want to be cached. Some things you probably don't want to be cached. Like if you're doing the stock market where millions of dollars could be won or lost based on like up to the second decision, you might not cache the pages because someone might be looking at the, uh, the, the, the stock prices as of you know, 8 a.m. today when they changed, they doubled or tripled since then or something like that. So you could say don't cache that page. But something that was less, uh, less volatile or, or less time critical, like say the weather forecast for the next five days. Chances are good between now and eight in the morning, the weather forecast for the next five days really hasn't changed. So you could say that pay, well, yeah, you never know. Living in this area, it could have changed five times already. But um, at the very least, you're not going to lose thousands of dollars, probably, if you get that wrong. But you could say that page could be cached. So you can define on a page-by-page -page basis, this page is okay to cache, this page is not okay to cache, and bring it up. So it could be the current page or it could be other pages. Now the thing is you would have had to visit them once. So if you didn't visit Cleveland Weather, for example, it wouldn't have it cached on your local device so it couldn't bring up the old version of it. Um, in addition, standalone applications can still talk to a server. All right. Um, it can have local databases to store some information and then it can transfer uh, information to the server when you connect to it. So there's all different kinds of schemes that you can use, all right? For example, you download your Facebook application, right, to your phone, an Android device, all right? Uh, and you can't, if, if your internet connection was down, let's say, you might see the last thing that you, um, your last version of the page, but you might not be able to post anything new, for example. So it's sort of a gray area between the two. Yes? No, it, uh, no, it, it would have to be stored locally. If you, if you stored it on the server, that would be different than caching. 
All right. Again, the whole reason for this caching is if you cannot connect to the server, you have at least something on your local machine to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good question. Um, uh, something like a shopping cart, the question was. That could be done any number of ways. That could be done, that could be saved on, your, on the client as a cookie. That also could be saved in a database table on the server. Probably you would save it a, a, in a database. So it would know who you were and, and uh, it would know that you, you said you wanted to buy these three things and it would save it in your shopping cart and you logged in tomorrow, it would still be there. So it would probably be stored in a database. Right. The point is, is between all these, there is, there's gray areas where you can, if you're clever, you can design your web application so you can at least give some functionality through caching if the website is down. And on a standalone application, you can share some data by either having a network database or a cloud database to store data. Like, for example, we might all have, we could have, for example, a, a application to view the schedule at LC. Maybe all the faculty have an application. We don't, but we could. Right? But we would be connected to a database that was here on LC. So our application would be local, but the database would be um, at a distance. And maybe periodically, a copy of the database is loaded to our machine, and that would get updated, or something like that. There's also something called Java Web Start. And I'm going to... See if I can find a good example of that. In the old days, there were things called applets, which essentially were Java that would run within a browser. But those have sort of fallen out of favor. Uh, Java Web Start um, is another one. Um, All right, the way this is configured is saving this file as a JNLP file. And then when I open it, it will open up uh, this and I'm going to click later to run it. And it's going to open up as a Java application something that I downloaded from the web, but it's going to open it up like that. Notice already I'm getting all these security warnings, <laughs> right? Uh, all right, there we go. Just a little application where we can add stuff and we can remove nodes and we can add more nodes and so on. All right, this is a Java application that was deployed via the web. But it was deployed like on sort of a, a um, as-needed basis. Now, this is sort of halfway between the web and the uh, a, a cloud-based solution and a local. Because it did download something to my machine. And I have to have Java enabled. And I have to have permissions right and all that. But if I were to go and run this the next time, I'd get the new version of it. Question? OK. Let's see if I can make a jar, all right? So we've sort of covered the web side of things. What I want to try with the last 10 minutes is to make a jar. I'm apologizing in advance because I have 10 minutes to do this, and I probably do this once a year, all right? I don't even do it twice a year, once every semester, because spring semester is online. So <laughs> uh, I just, the students just watch a video of me doing this. So I'm going to try to make a jar, and I apologize in advance if this doesn't work.
I think it's important even if this doesn't work to talk about some things. So. All right, first thing of all, I want to look in this real quickly. If you're really interested, you can see an example of a Java applet. But guess what? Chrome doesn't support applets anymore, so those are going out of fashion. All right? Also, I have an example of JWS, which I can launch the app. I can allow. Then I'm back to the same situation I was before, except in this case I get an error. But otherwise, it would have launched the app. All right. But what I'm interested in is creating a jar. Now, notice what I have. My Java classes are in a directory structure. These directories are, are called packages. All right. And typically with packages, you use what's called sort of the reverse domain style of naming them. So for example, here we are, you know, we are at Lorraine Community College. What's our URL? What's our domain? It's lorrainecc.edu. All right? So, if I were a Java programmer here, I would give my packages names starting with e the reverse of the domain, edu.lorrainecc. So, I could maybe then subdivide that because maybe CIS has some classes and maybe engineering has some classes. So I could further separate that. I could then further separate and say, well, this is a Java class as opposed to the advanced Java class, which we don't have, but theoretically we could. All right. Then I could separate that into GUI and conversions. So what I'm doing effectively is I'm creating folders and subfolders for all of my classes. And the top level, the top two levels are going to be the reverse of my domain. EDU, Lorraine CCC, and then I can subdivide it any way that makes sense. So in this example I have EDU, Lorraine CCC, CISS, Java, and then I have conversions and GUI, just like I described there. EDU, Lorraine CCC are the two important ones. Why is that important? Because how many other Lorraine CCCs.edu are there in the world? There are no other ones. We are the only one. So that domain name is going to guarantee that my classes have a unique package name, provided someone doesn't cheat or doesn't make a mistake following it. And if they, make, if they don't follow the, the, the protocol for this, then it's on them, right? It's not on me. Now, why is this important? This is important because this allows us to qualify the names of certain classes. I have a class called Conversion, all right, that relates to something that I, need, I want to run in, in my program. The engineering department might ha also have their own Conversion class that does something totally different than mine. Well, if I'm compiling my Java code, I want to be able to specify that the conversion class I want to use is mine and not engineering's, or not code that we got from Tri-C or some other organization that, that we purchased or whatever. I want to make sure 
I can fully qualify and say this is the conversion class I want to use. All right? So we put things in packages like that and we refer to the package. So if we look in my GUI, We look at my GUI. We will notice two things. First of all, on top we have specified the package that this guy lives in. It lives in EDU Lorraine, CS, Lorraine CCC. Uh, CISS Java GUI. We then import, remember we've done importing all along since the second or third week probably. Here we're importing one of my classes. Now why haven't we had to do this before? We haven't had to do this before because all our classes have been in the same folder. So all, my, all our classes have been in the same package. But now we have a class in a different package. We have conversions in this conversion class, or in this conversion package. So I have to specify that, yeah, my temperature class is the temperature class that belongs in this package, and not in the engineering divisions package or anything like that. Now, I might go a little long today to wrap this up. We'll, we'll try to end timely. So that's the one thing I have to do now that I've split things into packages, is I have to identify where each class lives, what package it lives in, and I have to use the import to import my own classes if they live in a different package. All right? So now I want to go and I want to compile this. This is where the fun might start. All right, let's see if I can do this. I'll make this bigger. I'm going to keep the results my old one in case this fails. I'll be like the TV chef that has a turkey already in the oven in case theirs doesn't get done on time. So I'm going to say Java C. So I'm compiling. I'm going to say class path, that dash class path, and I'm going to give the name of a directory where I want the compiled stuff to go. All right? So I'm going to say class wed, meaning class Wednesday. I've already done this before, and my results are in the, the folder called classes. So I'm going to keep that just in case this goes wrong. And then I'm going to put in the, the file that I want to compile. I'm going to put the path to it. So the path to it is edu slash what slash Lorraine CCC slash CISS slash Java slash GUI slash and what did we call it? We called it. GUI.java. Now why am I just compiling this? It's going to find those other things and compile those as well. So I go drum roll please and run this. It did its thing. And It 
cannot find that, which is what I was afraid of. All right. So I did something incorrect with compiling that. I am not sure what. Yeah, that, that's a possibility. ADU line CCC CISF conversions doesn't exist. There it is. I'm not really sure why it gave me an error. If it did work, though, <laughs> this is what you'd get. You would get EDU, Lorraine CCC, CISS, with the compiled version of, of temperatures and with the compiled version of the first GUI. What you can do then is you can make a jar. All right. Once you've compiled everything in their packages and have gotten your class path done, all right, you can make a jar. You need to make a manifest file. The manifest tells it what the main class is for this application and other information. The main class, remember, is a class that has a main in it, right? Now, potentially, you could have more than one main class. So you have to specify which one you actually want for this jar. So I'm specifying that's the class I want to make. And the syntax to make a jar would be jar cv the name of the jar file and then finally the input files I have to, I forget, all right, in, in the case of default manifest. Let's see what this does for us. All right, something didn't work. All right, clearly. Once you make the jar, though, you end up with this, a jar. You double click it, and that fires up your Java. So this would be the only file that you would need to deploy, and it would contain all your classes archived together. And this would be how other people could use your classes, is they would need the jar um, located so that they could import the classes from your things. So I'm sorry it didn't work. You won't be asked to do this, obviously, on the final. But you will be asked to know, sort of on a conceptual level, what a jar is. Um, standalone versus cloud-based, um, different deployment options, respective advantages and disadvantages. Yes? So all you need is a jar file to give to someone? All you need is a jar file to give to someone, 
correct. And, and they, would have to have the they would have to have the JRE, correct. And if your if your Java uh, application required any uh, other um, resources, they would need those too. For, for example, like a database or whatever. If you did that. Um, one last thing, one advantage of writing something that gets deployed and installed on the device is it can be specific to that device. So for example, an Android device can take advantage of the Android camera, whereas a web page that's sent to an Android device won't necessarily easily be able to take advantage of the Android device and the camera and all that. All right. Um, we'll see you upstairs. <laughs>